So after many questions, we got into uh, chapter 4, or into chapter 3, no, into chapter 4. Um, and uh, as, as we discussed last time, what I'll do is, is I'll talk for 45 minutes or, or an hour uh, about the text, and then... Uh, and we can have more questions and discussion. You know, it's the questions and, and discussion is really valuable. So I really want to encourage you to um, ask questions and to really, you know, see. The thing is, if you have a question, it might very well be that somebody else has the same question, and uh, they're just afraid to ask. So. <clears throat> So we started out in chapter 4, um, uh, where St. Paul talks about judgment, and judging one another, and how important it is not to do that. Um, uh, Paul says in, ch in verse 4, For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore ju judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will come from God. There's a huge amount of uh, writing in the patristic literature about judgment. Um, unfortunately, it's one of the great passions uh, that's so common uh, in the monastic life. Uh, of course, most of the spiritual literature was written in a monastic context by monks, for monks, about life in the monastery and how to live it and how not to live it. Um, and it's a spe all that uh, about uh, not judging is really about uh, how do you maintain a sense of, of unity and community. Um, one of the things about judge, judging our brother um, and the passions that go along with that, um, usually, usually first it starts with hurt. Being, having your feelings hurt by somebody. Then that turns to anger. Then the anger turns to resentment. And the resentment turn, can turn into hatred or it can turn into disdain. Um, or all sorts of other things. But one of the things that is, I think, very important to, uh, to look at in this process of uh, what happens when we judge another person is that we objectify them. Um, we start, instead of uh, seeing a dynamic person uh, with whom we are in relationship, uh, rather we have a concept of a person, that this is a bad person, this is a dangerous person, this person is not safe, this person is hurtful, this person uh, not only does this or that, but is this or that. Um, and, and this is especially... Um, difficult when there's been some, some fairly serious abuse. You know, it's one thing if somebody looks crosswise at you and you take offense, um, but some people will fall into resentment just for something like that. Um, but if there's, if there's a, some actual serious abuse, um, then it's a, much, it's a much deeper issue. Part of the thing about judgment of, of another is that, is that when we objectify a person like that, we have a static vision of that person, a static image of our own creation. In other words, we're not, we're not dealing with the person themselves. We're dealing with and confronting our own idea of who that person is, our own conceptual image. Um, and so uh, I think we all know about uh, how we can argue with those conceptual images and how we can tell them off and how we, how we can punch them out and on and on and on and on. Um, and what happens is we can go around and around and around and around and that person may have com just completely moved on, <laughs> you know, forgot about the incident, forgot that, you know, maybe even forgot that we exist, you know, if they... If, uh, if it wasn't some kind of, uh, you know, close friend or, or relative or somebody, but just somebody 
that we met in passing, but yet how easily we fall into this. Judgment um, in this case really means, uh, I think, to not only um, condemn a person um, as being uh, completely defined by by these, you know, by these the traits of whatever it was that happened in that particular incident, but it's also this laying on that we do of also of all of our a projection of all of our own stuff on that person. Um, when we judge. Uh, we, as I said, we lose, uh, instead of dealing with the actual person in dynamic relationship, we have this static conce conceptual image. Um, and, uh, and so that there's no communication <coughs> and hardly any communication possible if, uh, un until one is willing to get, get over the conceptual image and deal with the person as a, as a living, breathing person who is as sinful and broken just as I am. Um, and forgiveness in this sense, uh, because there is a lot of, uh, when it comes to dealing with our resentments, the only way ultimately is forgiveness. Uh, resentment is, is a judgment that has, that has kind of crystallized. Um, and, uh, and we're not, uh, and we're holding on to that. And we, sometimes we hold on to our, our judgments of other people, as it were, for dear life, even almost defining ourselves in terms of that conceptual image of that person, if it's been a strong enough kind of uh, resentment. And, we've, and, it, and it just builds and builds. Um, some of the, sometimes uh, when we've had, you know, difficult issues in our childhood and we've got these, these deep parental issues, um, part of it's based on judgment, part of it's based on um, not actually communicating but only dealing with, uh, with the, the conceptual image and, and not being able to really get beyond that. Well, to get beyond it, what we need to do is forgive. Now, to forgive does not mean to justify the action that hurt us. It doesn't, it doesn't mean to say, oh, it was all right. It certainly doesn't mean I deserved it. And then we also have to look in, at uh, not only about judging others, but judging ourselves. Um, Con not only condemning others, but condemning ourselves and bearing resentments against ourselves. And another thing which I think is a, is a very, uh, which is very real and, and yet um, it sounds very strange is um, how often we bear resentments against God hmm. and we need to forgive God because how often do we blame God for all of the bad things that have happened in our life? You know, for the death of, of somebody, of people who are close to us, for um, loss, of, loss of a job or loss of a lifestyle or house or whatever. Um, so we blame, we blame God. Uh, sometimes we blame God because he didn't make us, you know, beautiful according to our idea of, of it. We're beautiful in his sight but not necessarily in our own. And so, and so we, we lay all of these resentments up. Um, and, and these uh, resentments are actually a part of our ego structure. Remember the ego, um, the false self, is what we create by our own thoughts. And so, for example, if you have a huge resentment like against your mother or against your father, and you're, you're going to define yourself that I'm not going to be like that and that, you know, uh, that mean, nasty old so-and-so, you know. Um, 
or you might define yourself completely in terms of, of your mother and father in a positive sense. Um, that also is problematic because it's still not you. But as we, when we build an ego, um, as, as we, as we uh, mature, uh, that um, part of that is, can, consists of the resentments that, that, that we bear. Now, breaking down that ego and breaking down that false self is what's absolutely critical uh, to live a, a spiritual life. Because otherwise, all we do is we get caught in that, in that cycle of thoughts that are generated uh, from our resentments and from, and from our conceptual images. Um, and we're living in reaction to those, uh, to those images, to those thoughts, to those resentments. Um, and so part of the, part of the beginning of, a spirit, of the spiritual process is to break through them through forgiveness. Um, as I began to say, forgiveness is not about justifying um, the other person's action against you. If you were abused, that's not your sin. That's the sin of the person who abused you. Now, your own reaction to it may be a sin, may be sinful. But, but the initial abuse, say somebody, oh, I don't know, um, say your, your girlfriend dumps you in, in high school, you know, um, or your boyfriend dumps you in high school. And, um, you know, and so, and so think, and of course you're, you're really hurt by that, right? Think of all of the areas Think of all of the passions that that hits, you know, certainly anger, most likely lust, um, pride, vainglory, you know, is this whole complex of passions within us that are uh, brought, brought into play by, uh, by this, this one um, incident of, of, this, of this relationship which didn't work out. Um, uh, and say your girl, your girlfriend dumps you for the captain of the fo of the football team, and so um, you all of a so sudden have, or, whereas it probably never occurred to you before, you s suddenly start comparing yourself to the captain of the football team. Um, you know, he's stronger, he's more muscular, he's better looking, he's faster, he's can you know, he's on, 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 you know all these things, you know. Which instead of uh, using to um, acknowledge that that this guy's in good shape and he's you know nice looking and you're using it as a a hammer against yourself because you're not just saying oh he's strong and muscular and athletic and all of this he's you're saying he's stronger than I am he's more athletic than I am he's better looking than I am and on and on and on and on <coughs> and so and so gradually what happens in the resentments is they get is is they ultimately turn against ourselves and we're not even dealing with a with a, with the concrete real person we're dealing with this image of, of a person, and especially if we don't really know them that well. Um, and so what do we need to do to forgive? To forgive means to overlook the, the action, to overlook the, uh, the ideas and the feelings, to overlook our conceptual image, image and start dealing with the person as he or she is. And be willing to restore that bond of love, or at least an openness of love towards, towards that person. Now, if somebody severely abused you, that doesn't mean you restore the relationship. But until you, uh, but if there's abuse involved in particular, um, until you let go of the resentment, you remain in the other person's control. 
which is usually the last thing that you want if somebody has abused you, to be controlled by that other person. And yet that's, that's really what happens when we refuse to let go of a resentment, is we're letting that person and that, uh, or at least our conceptual image of that person, and their actions towards us <coughs> govern our life. And so to forgive in that sense means to let go of that and to say, this person is a, is a, is a broken, sinful person just like I am. What, what he did was wrong against me. What she did was wrong against me. It was a sin. But I sinned by reacting in this, 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 and this. And then repenting of those. We can't repent for the other person's sin. But we have to repent of our own sins. We have to acknowledge it and it, very, and it helps to name it and to recognize what our reaction was that, that got us all caught up in this tangled web and in this downward spiral of a resentment that just pulls us into ourself uh, well, and beating our... And, and not only pulls us into ourself, but pulls us away not from other people as well as from God. Because that, that resentment which comes um, from our judgment of other, of other people pulls us into itself, pulls us into ourselves, and closes us off from authentic relationship. We need to be able to discern, um, both in ourselves as well as in other, in other people, actions that are right or wrong. If you see somebody committing some kind of sin, you've got to recognize, well, yes, that person is committing a sin. Um, him now, me yesterday, me tomorrow. <coughs> um, you can't exalt yourself over somebody um, uh, simply because they've fallen into a sin, because we have to recognize our own, um, our own weakness. Everybody turn off their cell phone. Appropriate um, Are you following me in this? Does it make sense? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, we have to recognize our own weakness. Um, we have to recognize our own weakness, um, especially in relationship to, uh, to judging other people. And especially if there is a... Um, <laughs> I like your ring better. There's somebody I know. He has a, he has a, a in, bells on a sensor for a ringtone, and that way, if it rings during the service, nobody would notice. <laughs> he's, the same, he's the same priest that um, I called him up one day, and I didn't know where he was, and he answered and said, "Just a second. Paki, Paki, Mira, Muslim. He was in the middle of a service. <laughs> um, anyway. But so far, so far as judging, St. Paul says, I don't even judge myself. And there's a... And w what he's not saying is, uh, he's not saying that he's not aware... Of, uh, of sin, um, but what, he, what he's saying is that he is, uh, he's not allowing any um, uh, sense of self-condemnation um, uh, into his life, because that ultimately, that clouds everything. Now, 
We have to be aware when we sin. Um, but one of the one of the things that's I think very important to remember in relation to that is that guilt is a trap. Uh, there's healthy guilt and there's unhealthy guilt. Unhealthy guilt is usually about uh, resenting oneself and resent, um, or resenting others. Healthy guilt is realizing I've done something and I better, and I better repent. I better apologize, I better make things right. That's healthy guilt. Um, healthy guilt is when we realize that we better go to confession. And it's very healthy guilt when, uh, uh, that keeps us from doing certain things so that we don't have to confess them, um, which, is also, which is a very useful tool, um, especially for, uh, for those of us who are weak and who like all sorts of things that we, uh, we would, probably wouldn't want to confess. Um, when when St. Paul here in <coughs> is saying, I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by, by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. One of the realities of our life, because of all of this uh, dynamic of, of, of this this ego, this false self that we create, of um, the resentments that we hold against ourselves, our negative uh, uh, judgments of ourselves often, um, not to mention our judgments against others, and, um, is that we cannot see ourselves clearly. Um, we leave it up to, ultimately we leave it up to Christ to judge us at the end. That's what um, uh, and so, and so we live in hope. We live in hope of that he will, of, uh, that, that of, of salvation. We live in hope, um, and, and indeed, uh, of the knowledge and experience of the kingdom of God, uh, by his grace in this life. Um. But, but, but to uh, boldly proclaim, I'm saved, is not usually our style in the Orthodox Church. Um, yes, we have been, yes, we have been saved in Christ. All of humanity has been saved in Christ. Every human being who has ever been born um, has, been, has been redeemed from death and will rise from the dead. But to what kind of a to what kind of a judgment? And that we can't see in this life because we're so our vision is so obscured by our own uh, inner turmoil. And so working through this this inner turmoil is critical for our spiritual life and working through judgments, obviously. Um, does anybody have any short question right here? Some people, when you don't judge them, you actually forgive them uh, when they do things. Mm -hmm. uh, when you don't react to whatever kind of abuse it is, it makes them angry, they escalate. Mm -hmm. What do you do in that situation? Well, if somebody's that abusive, then, um, then, it, then it's really important to uh, um, get some help with that, with that relationship. I mean, because you're, 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 <laughs> because you're prob if you're the constant object of the abuse, then you're probably not the person who can uh, who can talk to them. Most likely because there's a judgment, mm -hmm. or and they're not dealing with the real you. They're dealing with a conceptual image. So you remove yourself from the abusive person. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's really important. <clears throat> question. When you say we shouldn't uh, judge people at all, do you mean that we shouldn't observe and evaluate their behavior? I mean, if somebody in this room, I doubt it would happen, were to behave in a morally inappropriate way, I bet you everybody would come to just a personal, immediate judgment that that was inappropriate behavior. Sort mm -hmm. of an inevitable reaction, and, and even a good one, that keeps us morally tuned into life. Right. When you're saying we shouldn't judge, are you saying that we shouldn't come to larger, overreaching judgments that are sort of based on the sum of the individual parts, the type of judgments that lead to the decision, well, this guy is just a bad person, he's a jerk, he's a sinner. Is that the type of judgment you're saying we should Yeah, judge? it's, I think, you know, we, we, need, we need to be able to make those kind of um, discernments that, yes, that behavior is inappropriate or sinful or, uh, or harmful or negative or abusive or whatever. I mean, that's simply observing reality. Um, I think the judgment here uh, is, you know, and, and especially, um, and, and here St. Paul is talking about very specifically about, about judging as in a court, whether, you know, about guilt or innocence regarding transgressions of the law. I'm talking about judgment in a much more, a much deeper uh, spiritual sense. Um, but I think, I think the kind of judgment that's referred to when, uh, when the Lord and St. Paul say, do not judge, is precisely this whole process of building a resentment and, um, and uh, not, uh, uh, and not really seeing the, the person for who they are, being blinded by that resentment, um, and, uh, and building a, this uh, false um, st uh, static image of who, th of who that person is rather than what they do. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Yeah. What do you the judgment does not necessarily as related to resentment. You can imagine many situations where uh, one would not resent somebody, but he would judge this person. Like, uh, I think that somebody committed something bad, not, not, no sin was done against me, I have no resentment. Mm -hmm. Yet I would judge this person as good for nothing. And, <coughs> Easily imagine the situation. Mm -hmm. But yet, what you're still you're still objectifying them um, according to their action, and um, uh, and not seeing the real person for who they are. Now, it's probably you know if you've got somebody who's who's committing all sorts of horrible crimes and things, um, then it's it's pretty likely you don't you're. you're um, not going to have the chance to uh, um, get to know that person for who they are. I mean, you're going to have this image of, of this criminal, and, um, and, that's, and that's very difficult. In a sense, it's even, in a sense, that detachment, that detached judgment um, is very the harmful. Sin, not the person. Right. The sin, the sin we... We judge the sin, not the person. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Good. Uh, Good. Does this apply to positive judgment as well? I mean, we can over-idealize a person. Oh, right? yeah. That's very easy to do. And, uh, and, then, and that makes a complete mess of the, whole, of, of the relationship as well. When you over-idealize somebody. Um. You know, my question would be probably about this uh, more or less abusive relationship because, you know, when the relationship is such that, you know, there is something maybe in me that provoking person, another person, continuously do something that I definitely don't like, you know, mm -hmm. I don't accept this. It is abusive because, you know, it is really about norms of um, uh, relationship. <coughs> and there is no way to uh, withdraw yourself because with, from this relationship because this person is very close person to mm -hmm. you. But it is something, it is kind of like a codependence relationship, mm -hmm. you know. Right. So, uh, 
how to because the judgment here is is clear you know because when somebody is abusing you it is abuse you know mm -hmm. so there is definition to that right. you know when the person is screaming at you mm -hmm. when the person is um, I don't want just to give an example but you know it is clear mm -hmm. um, so um, I'm just trying to uh, feel how to forgive this person how just because each time you, I'm provoking the person too, you know, to behave the way he or she does to me. I'm provoking here, you know. Well, uh, it is you... something in me that triggers this well, relationship too. I think I think it's you, you have to be very careful about that. You have you have to if if you are intentionally provoking somebody. Not not intentionally, no. But it is something natural that exists in me that doesn't go along with another person. Right, but uh, I think what we, we can expect that uh, from, well, and should expect from other people that um, they will uh, contain themselves and not behave abusively, uh, even, if, even if they somehow feel provoked. Um, but you know, even sometimes intention in them is such deeply rooted that you cannot and especially, you know, when we are talking about this confession, we are communicating with people who sometimes are not Christian at all. Right. You know? So, but you see, uh, even among our close relatives, mm -hmm. there are people who are not even close to the church. True, but um, but I I don't think this has anything to do necessarily. Other than that, the, the Lord tells us not to judge people. He's not. He's not just saying don't judge fellow Christians. But how to forgive? Well, and the forgiveness means to to overlook that that action or that or that behavior, and see that there's a person on on the other side who is also struggling, and to and to be able to open your your yourself to them again. Now. You got to. You, you have to be wise in that. If it's somebody who's been who's been seriously abusive, you um, you don't you don't uh, um, you don't restore the relationship. But you cannot. It is very close people to you. You know. It's just you know we can behave more or less well for the people who are distant to us. But you know, with the person who is next to you, you. <coughs> You just let yourself go as you want, as well as you are, you know. Mm -hmm. It is much easier to hurt your uh, relative than to hurt your uh, acquaintance. Yes, absolutely. It is much easier to be hurt by your relatives than to be hurt by a stranger. Mm -hmm. Stranger you can forgive easily, mm -hmm. much more difficult to go and build a relationship with a people next to you. Yeah. Well, I think that's why a lot of resentments are against family members. And, um, you know, you can, you know, obviously there are resentments that happen outside the family as well, but it's, it's those close relationships. And you, and, and you have to be wise, but you also have to, you have to, you have to, you have to look and see where, if you were in, if you were intentionally provoking somebody, or is their behavior just out of line? Uh, another thing, how not to feel guilty yourself? You said, you know, just uh, don't, if relationships are abusive, don't take a complete blame for this. Right. But you see, uh, is there is something in me that also provoking these people to behave the way they do? <laughs> well, you know, I, th I don't think, I think when behavior is... Uh, is is abusive and inappropriate. We can't excuse it. We can't say, "Oh, I provoked it," or "I deserved it." I think that's wrong. I think we need. I think we need to say this behavior was inappropriate, and this this behavior was wrong and it was sinful, and there's no there's no justification for it. Uh, no matter no matter what the. Uh, um, no matter what the provocation, 
you know, if somebody, somebody beats somebody else up, um, or uh, rapes somebody or, or something, you know, the, the violence, that's never, ever, ever acceptable behavior. And, um, and that has to be, uh, and you have to recognize that there is no <coughs> provocation that, uh, that could justify that behavior. Now, if you're saying, if you're looking to see how, how did, it is a kind of, that would be a codependency kind of thing, to say, oh, how did I, you know, how did I provoke that, how, I must have deserved that, I, you know, that's, that's part of that codependent cycle. Um, but, uh, and then you have to, then you have to look at yourself, too. Um, but, uh, but we can never justify somebody's abusive actions against us. Um, we have to recognize them always for what they are, and that's, and that's sin. And that will actually help the other person as well, uh, more than justifying them. Um, because they need, to re they need to recognize that their, their behavior was wrong. Um, and uh, not make any excuses for it. It is easy to forgive if the person does recognize it, but if the person does not, That's much it is harder. how to continue love. You know, if you just see that the person is absolutely determined in his righteousness, mm -hmm. you know, and Tomorrow, it will be exactly the same happening, you know. Mm. There is no hope, you know, how to forgive and, and, and yeah, just... That's when you need some, that's when you need to go to the priest or get some counseling. How to love when there counseling. is no energy to love, you know, when... Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's when you need to get, to bring in a third party to, to help, like your priest. Uh, yeah, we're talking about judgment of somebody being overly positive and idealized. Uh, how is that different from what we do with saints? Well, the thing is with the saints, and it's, it's you know, I think, how many of you have read from the lives of the saints, like St. Dimitri of Rostov or something? Um, it's a very... The, the, I, the writings, the, like the lives of the saints, they're like icons. You know, it's, it's an icon in graphic form. Um, so there are no imperfections, there's no nothing, you know. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of formulaic very often. Um, and we don't get a... And I think this is something that as Americans that kind of doesn't feel quite comfortable um, very often. Um, uh, because it is such an idealized person, idealized image um, of the saint, and I think as Americans we we're much more into a kind of novel type of biography, um, uh, which is not to say that the lives of the saints are, are wrong or that it's bad. It's just it's just a very particular style and type of writing. Um, Actually, some of the most uh, instructive uh, things comes when you read when the lives of the saints actually talk about some of their weaknesses and how they overcame them. And I think, as Americans in particular, we appreciate that. Um, uh, you know, whether it's uh, um, Dorotheus of Gaza who wrote in the, what, 6th or 7th century, um, or Father Seraphim Rose. Um, it's interesting to compare his biography with the letters of his, um, was it sister, that were published? <coughs> anyway. Um, I think it was Seraphim his niece. Rose. His niece? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't remember who exactly it was. And we see the real struggle involved um, in, uh, in leading the Christian life. Um, 
on the other hand, we have to. One of the things about the saints is, uh, you know, sometimes from reading the lives of the saints, that you think that the saint was um, uh, this perfect deified <coughs> being from the from the time they were born, and that's usually not the case. Usually, they uh, they attain to sanctity through tremendous struggle. Um, and when you read the ascetic literature, it, it talks about that struggle um, and how important that is. And that uh, attaining that, uh, to attain to sanctity doesn't mean that, um, uh, that you don't have any struggle. It means your struggle is even greater, probably, than that, those of most people. Because, at least speaking for myself, um, you know, I don't struggle as much as I know I could. You know, against against sins, against passions, against thoughts, against you know, um, but the more we, uh, uh, the more you know, it really it really takes tremendous effort to attain <coughs> to attain to sanctity. Unless you're a martyr, then, and then then it just takes immense courage, immense courage, and faith. Remembered Saint Mary of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lesson in that regard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, think of this. I mean, th you can't even imagine the struggles for uh, for decades and decades and decades. Um, but at the same time, one thing struck me from her life mm -hmm. that, and that was she knew all the psalms. Mm -hmm. That people had a kind of a vocabulary that they could go to mm -hmm. to struggle with that we skip a lot of the time. Yeah. Well, one of the things that um, we'll talk about when we get into chapter 5 is the discipline of, of being an Orthodox Christian. So, I yeah. make another comment. Kind of, I'm not really addressing maybe your larger point of sort of mm -hmm. overarching larger judgments, but just giving a sort of pragmatic, everyday life. Mm -hmm. That is, <clears throat> I think it's inevitable and, and necessary that we actually do have enough of a moral sense to judge. And oftentimes, with the people that we are closest to live with, work with, we have to express these judgments and even criticize others. I mean, I'm personally of the view that one should do that very sparingly and even be very tolerant about small points. Sometimes this pragmatic is not worth it to point it out. Mm -hmm. As someone pointed out, though, we should always maintain both within our own minds and in expressing it that we are judging the action mm -hmm. rather than making an overarching judgment of the person. But mm -hmm. my bottom line view is that I think that when you think it's about criticism, whether you're criticizing for moral behavior mm -hmm. or just a person's abilities, aptitudes, how well they do a job, is that being the frail psychological creatures we are, in most cases, not in all cases, but in most cases, the person receiving the criticism takes it more harshly than it's intended. Mm -hmm. And that's why with most people, it's good to deliver any criticism more softly than you should. Mm -hmm. Not with all people. Some people it's just water off their back and it's almost hard to affect them in any way. But I think that's just a, a challenge of human behavior in life. Well, I think one has to be extremely careful in criticizing other people. Um, now, if you're, if you're, if you're in a position... Just pointing out, just pointing out the behavior. It not, not criticism always implies a, like this larger moral judgment. Just pointing out what they did, mm -hmm. which was perhaps wrong and appropriate, and um, I think I think we make these judgments every day. Actually, the question is how to respond to them. We do, but you know, um, to actually uh, criticize. I mean, we can point we can point things out in you know depending on our relationship with the person, but usually one should it it should be one's responsibility uh, to do that if you're going to do that. One of the things that's absolutely dangerous, though, is to sit around and talk about people. The fathers t tell us never, ever to do that. Um, you know, I can just hear these, these, you know, some of these conversations that um, I've heard in other coffee hours. Um, <laughs> oh, look at her hair. Oh, she's dressed like a prostitute. <laughs> oh, you know, why is she doing that? Why is he doing this? Who? You know, and then all this speculation, and you know, and did you hear what so and so did, and on and on and on and on and on. Um, the fathers tell us never, ever, ever to talk about people, and this was a um, 
This is a, a fundamental rule in monasteries because what it does is it, it, that just destroys community and destroys the uh, you know the way of uh, the possibility for actual interaction because it'll inevitably inevitably get back to the person that oh so and said so said this about you and that, that, and, you know. so so we have to be extremely careful um, and and even to look at other people's behavior you know we have to discern um, if somebody if somebody did something wrong we say yes they did something wrong um, uh, but we also have to be extremely careful uh, to remember that um, though that person may have done that now I did it yesterday and so we have we have absolutely no basis to judge um, because all it does is manifest our own hypocrisy um, and that's really and that watchfulness over our own hypocrisy is one of the most valuable spiritual tools that there is. Um, the Blessed Elder Dimitri of Santa Rosa, um, uh, Father Dimitri Yagorov, um, was a wonderful holy man. Alexander knows him, knew him too. Um, uh, he said, mercilessly persecute hypocrisy within yourself. And I think this is something that I'd, I'd like, you know, we, actually I, I did for a while. I, I wrote it out and put it on a card and put it in front of my, in front of my desk so I could see it, you know, and, and, and think about it. Because if, if, our, if our judgment is hypocritical, and it usually is in reality, um, <coughs> then our ability to point out other people's shortcomings um, is hypocritical and because it's usually self-aggrandizing um, and and thus it's spiritual suicide to do that now if it's, if it's your responsibility to do that if you're their boss and you need them to, to do something else <laughs> or do it better um, then then that's your responsibility and and um, and the criticism uh, should always be in a uh, in a constructive way, and ne you know, telling somebody off is 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 never acceptable as a Christian, um, even if we want to. Um. I, I like the expression, but you know, the two words don't go together quite well. Merci mercifully persecute. <laughs> Mercilessly. Mercilessly. I see. I, I said mercifully. I said, how does it go together? Sorry, I misheard. Mercilessly. Thank you. Oh, who was that that said that? Uh, Father Dimitri of Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa. Uh -huh, Santa California. Rosa. He's an, a, a, a wonderful Russian elder um, who... Uh, Ended up in California, and uh, I, I'll once uh, bring it up a little bit later in the questions, and I'll tell you the story. Mm -hmm. um, he, he was he was a big influence on my life, and on on many of those that around that uh, that touched him, on Alexandra. So, um, so. Um, St. Paul moves on in chapter 4, uh, verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Not to think beyond what is written. It's a very interesting phrase. Um, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against another, or the other. For who makes you different from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign, that we also might reign with you. Paul uses a little bit of uh, sarcasm here. Um, for I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. We have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. 
To the present hour we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. <coughs> Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. I think what he's doing is he's, he's trying to provoke a little guilt in the Corinthians um, for them to see their own uh, uh, hypocrisy in having judged him. Um, because ultimately the whole context of this is that the Corinthians were judging Paul and Apollos. Um, for, for, for what? Um, that uh, Apollos was better than Paul, or Paul mm -hmm. was better than Apollos, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, what, and what, what he's saying is, you know, it's the same, there, it's the same gospel. They're conveying the same message. Um, and and what do you, what do you have that that you have not received? In other words, they've give, they've uh, they've just they've received it, and there's no reason to be puffed up with pride and arrogance. Um, but I think I think it's very interesting this. You know um, this last section. Um, I'm talking about apostleship in Christ. Um, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored, and so forth. Um, he's talking to the church. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless and labor working with our own hands. It sounds like he's complaining a little bit. Um, but, but I think, you know, what, what ultimately he's, he's trying to do is to, is to uh, uh, Bring, he's trying to bring the Corinthians to a sense of what um, the apostles have suffered for their sake in order that they might receive. And so how does he react to all of this? Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. In other words, instead of um, when 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 being uh, when being reviled, instead of reviling back, we bless. And being persecuted, they endure and not sh not shirk it. Being defamed, simply entreat. Then he goes on. For I do, not, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore I urge you, imitate me. <coughs> For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I know that, and I know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod, or in love, and a spirit of gentleness? I think this... Uh, this passage in uh, 14 through uh, 16 is, is really uh, a, fun, a foundational and, cr and crucial passage. For I have begotten you in Christ Jesus. Uh, 
For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. The, the most important, and I would say the most foundational structural relationship within the church is the relationship of a spiritual father and a spiritual child. Um, it's uh, something you see in every, in every aspect of the life of the church, in the institutions of the church. Um, it goes back all the way to that relationship. Isn't that the relationship that a bishop should have with his priests? Shouldn't the bishop be the spiritual father of the priests? Shouldn't the priest be the spiritual father of his parishioners? Shouldn't the abbot be the spiritual father of his monks? The abbess being the spiritual father, spiritual mother of her children. Um, when, of course, when the New Testament was being written, the church was had not really crystallized into an institution where uh, where these relationships lost a lot of their uh, personal content. But one of the things that's so important uh, in this is that the relationship of a spiritual father and a spiritual child is an exceedingly personal relationship. Um, it's not it's not something that's pro forma. It's not something that's uh, that can that's that's simply an institution. It's it's a living encounter between two persons. So that so that the elder might impart the gospel of Jesus Christ, might impart the faith, might impart the way of being a Christian to the younger. And that the younger, by offering his obedience to the elder, might grow in that, in that, in that path and might learn how to overcome, first of all, himself, and, uh, and, and, to, and to work up that, uh, the, the ladder of the spiritual life. <coughs> To grow to, uh, to grow into maturity. Through that guidance, we even see this relationship of a of a godparent to their godchild, because what's a sponsor? Isn't it a kind of spiritual fatherhood, or spiritual motherhood? You know, it's a, and you know, the church is built on these relationships, and and really, how is the faith conveyed? except in an extremely personal way. Um, there's always, it's all, it's all about a set of relationships, not just about a set of doctrines and disciplines. The doctrines and disciplines are there, but the living experience of faith and entrance into that, into the living community is, is all about personal relationship. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the core and of this is is modeled on the family, um, and one of the things that uh, uh, I think is very important to point out that the family is a consecrated community. It's what marriage does. It it's a con it consecrates. A community, so that that community is itself uh, a an image and actually a participation in the fullness of the body of Christ. There's another kind of consecrated community in the life of the church, and that's a monastery. But a, a parish is a little different. Um, there have to be those relationships of spiritual fatherhood and of obedience and all of that. But it's, um, but you can't, uh, but, but the, a parish priest has to respect that uh, fundamental um, relationship of fatherhood of, of the husband of each family and support, and support them in their role of, uh, of leadership and headship within the family. And that's not, and that's while that's while it's patriarchal, that doesn't necessarily mean it's oppressive. Orthodoxy is all about patriarchy. There's no two ways around it. Um, uh, but when you there's 
there's the kind of unhealthy patriarchy that the feminists um, have objected to. And, um, and they're absolutely right in their condemnation of unhealthy patriarchy. But when it's healthy, and when it's really functioning, it's a beautiful thing. But when it's abusive, it's horrible. Um, I can tell you all about the feminist stuff since I went to Berkeley in the 90s. <laughs> Graduate Theological Union, Oye Bay. Um, but that relationship with spiritual fatherhood, it's something really to think about. That we need, we need to have that in our lives. And it needs to be a... a, a uh, ev and every one of us, it doesn't matter what kind of position that you occupy within the life of the church. You know, priests and bishops and metropolitans and even patriarchs um, need spiritual fathers. Patriarch Alexei um, had uh, Elder Kirill living with him. Um, Patriarch Kirill has uh, Elder um, Eli living with him his spiritual father. And one of, the, one of the things, I have to say one of the reasons that I really trust the Russian Orthodox Church um, is that it's, it's, it's not just the patriarch who's, who makes the final decisions. He talks, he talks to his spiritual father. He's accountable to his spiritual father about, about his decisions. <clears throat> and that's really, really critically important. Um, that spiritual fatherhood uh, uh, and sp or spiritual motherhood because that operates in, in virtually identical way uh, in a women's monastery um, is, the, is the defining relationship um, uh, within a monastery. And the goal of that spiritual fatherhood or motherhood is to bring out the fullness of, of, the, per, of, of the person of the disciple. To develop uh, the disciple not into some kind of, um, uh, you know, army of uh, identical clones, but rather so that each person's unique gifts would, would be brought out, would be utilized uh, for the sake of the whole. Remember, as the scriptures say, the, uh, the gifts that we've been given have been given for the upbuilding of the body. And so the gifts that each person in a community has been given are there for the, for the benefit of the whole community. And it's through exercising the gifts that each that each of us uniquely has been been given is where we find fulfillment as persons, where we develop as persons. Now, there are skills and things that we can also develop, and that's which is which is nice and which is interesting. But but I, but I think we we all know that each one of us has has unique gifts which just give us joy when uh, when we exercise them. You know, maybe, maybe it's it's painting and iconography. Maybe it, you know, maybe it's writing. Maybe it, uh, maybe it's a, a church administration. That's not mine. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe it, uh, maybe it's celebrating the liturgy. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's making money. Because without without people who make money and donate uh, generously to the church, uh, how can the church? do its uh, charitable activities. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's doing it and doing charitable activities that, that that's one's great gift. And, and <coughs> one's personhood develops through there, through that. Now this, this brings us, I think, to the, uh, a very important distinction between the individual and the person. Uh, an individual is defined by what uh, uh, distinguishes him or her from others. A person is defined by what unites. 
as Orthodox Christians, what we focus on is the person. We would say that each individual bears with, within him or herself uh, the image of God which has to be developed through likeness towards God. But that development of likeness can only be, be done by achieving um, communion in love with others. John Zazielus wrote a whole lot about that. And there's some good stuff in there. But also some other ideas that are well. Um, but I think I think in that in that sense he's right on. And it's this personal quality that is what is brought out in us by our relationship with God and by our communion with God with one another. Because our relationship with God is not, you know, it's not about me and Jesus. You know, it's about all of us together. So that my salvation is contingent upon your salvation. And your salvation is contingent upon his salvation. And, and, my sal- and your salvation is contingent on mine. Because we're saved together as one body. As one... Uh, as one mystical person in Christ, um, united in Christ by the Holy Spirit. And so this this communion of love transcends our individuality, where uh, where we're bound one to another in this living experience of communion, which is imparted to us by the grace of the Holy Spirit, and which is what defines us and in our true self um, as, as a member of the body of Christ because that's who we are we want to think that um, you know we, we get caught in this worldly sense of, um, of who, who am I well I'm, you know I'm a priest I'm a bishop and you know, I'm an artist <laughs> on this and this and this. No. I'm, I'm part of the body of Christ. In other words, as St. Paul elsewhere said, um, for, uh, for I have died and my life is hidden with Christ in God. Um, and that reality is the reality of what it means to be a Christian, to be baptized, to be a, communica- a communicating member of the church. To be baptized means we died to ourself. We died to the old man and um, have been resurrected in Christ so that he is the very core and the content of our identity. And it's that, ex- that living experience of that which is what the life of the church is, and our spiritual life is all about. Um, to actualize that through our interaction with one another, through our through our liturgical prayer, through our sacramental participation, in our own prayer, and 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 simply how we treat one another in the communion of love. Yeah. Is that, is that what is meant by unus Christianos, nolus Christianos? One Christian is no Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that um, Saint Augustine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's we can't. We're not Christians by ourselves. Um, and and just and and again, being a Christian. Um, is not about simply subscribing to a, uh, a set of doctrines and, and ideas. But, uh, and, or, and it's not about, and it's actually, and being orthodox is not about what you do and going, what you do when you're in church. It's about living orthodox. Um, and so, uh, it's on, on the basis of this, then, Paul goes in to upgrade the, the Corinthians for their immorality. 
um, so, so I will. Can I ask? A let, so we'll go into questions now. You know, uh, uh, I, can you clarify? I know that you said it, but I really didn't understand uh, two things in this um, little part that we read. We are weak, and but you are strong. Who are we, and who are you? St. Paul is speaking in the name of the Apostles. So we, the Apostles, are weak, but you, the Corinthians, are strong. He's being sarcastic. There. Um, because, because they're basically coming off arrogant. And he's trying to, and he's trying to cut them down to size. This would not be clear for me, you know, that I would not expect that what the, sarcasm here is not really. You, you, find, you find all sorts of things in the scriptures. Yeah. Because, um, you know, as Saint, um, you have to become all, all things to all men in, in order to, uh, to save some. And, you know, so every, the, the apostles, the writers of the scriptures used every literary device that they, they could in order to to get the point across. I, I, I would elaborate it as uh, you think you're weak, you think you're strong, we know we're weak. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that connects to what Christ told Paul, says my, my grace is perfected in weakness. Right. Right. Yeah, actually, um, uh, you know, in a sense, what what Paul is pointing out is that these are all worldly values. Um, you know, to, to be strong and to be wise and to be uh, according to this world. But, but that's all foolishness to God, because the because the wisdom of the wisdom of God is, and, and the wisdom of God is foolishness to the world, because it's through through that weakness that perfection is revealed. Through that, um, uh, through that, uh, that foolishness, God's wisdom is revealed. So, would the last um, uh, couple of. Um, verses would be also sarcasm for the kingdom of God doesn't consist in talks but in power well, that's, that, no that's, that's uh, not is, sarcasm this is number 20, you know, 20. It, I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out you know this number 20 mm -hmm. would, um, uh, for the kingdom of God doesn't mm -hmm. consist in talk but in power right okay well you got to look at it in the context of the rest of the paragraph um, he said, now some are puffed up, or some are arrogant, in other words, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, and I will, and I will know not the word of those who are, who are arrogant, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. In other words, he's not going to be listening to empty words. He's going to be, look, he's going to be looking at, at what is, what's really going on. Um, and uh, he's not going to be listening to the boasts of, of those who think that they're the, of the, to the boasting of the self-righteous but he's going to be uh, looking to see, looking to see um, uh, what it is, that, what it is that, the, that God is revealing in his power because that ultimately is it, um, you know, especially when you look at the, you know, the next chapter, he's, he, 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 he rips them up and down um, for allowing incest uh, within the community. And he even um, goes so far as to, as to condemn somebody, to, uh, to condemn this, the perpetrator and consign him to Satan. <laughs> That's, which is like, we don't even understand exactly what that means, um, but uh, it, you know. But what he was confronting was 
was that the Corinthians were boasting of their strength and of their wisdom. <coughs> and so um, he says, I'm not, let's see, I do not write these things to shame you. Well, yes, he does. <laughs> he's trying to he's trying to bring them bring them to a sense of uh, contrition and reality instead of their boasting. You know what what is confusing me probably you know this uh, words are, that are chosen mm -hmm. you know not consistent talks but in power and we know that uh, power of God and His weakness you know so uh, is it the same parable or this is just a completely different what does He mean here and. Uh, um, um, I my guess is that the, he's he's not referring to. He's not referring to that. And even when I look at the Russian translation, it is even more confusing because, you know, it says not instead of words in talk, it says in word mm -hmm. as opposed to talk, mm -hmm. but in power. So it is even, you know, this, this particular piece is um, confusing to me. Mm -hmm. um. He wants to say um, that uh, what what he wants to say here, you know, I'm lost. Saint 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 John Chrysostom on this says, "Actions speak louder than words." Words says Paul. If those Corinthians who are now arrogant want to prove something, let them show me when I come whether they can do the same miracles I can do. I do not want to find them hiding behind a wall of words, for that sort of thing means nothing to me. <laughs> so, John Chrysostom kind of, he, he paraphrases the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> you know, you know, we buy the fruits that shall be known. Right. So, show me your deeds rather than right. talks to talks mm -hmm. and actions. Mm -hmm. I asked something. Mm -hmm. You said that the beginning that we have to forgive God. How often, how often do we build up resentments against God? I don't know. I'm I think very often. Against myself, but not against God. <coughs> well, sometimes we blame God. Not, not everybody, you know. But some, but but there are many, but many people. Yeah, but how can we forgive God? I, it's a concept that is foreign. Uh huh. It it is on on the one hand. On the other, if we if we blame God for all the bad things that happen, what kind of a relation that happened to us and that hurt us and and are we going to want to have a, a, a are we going to want to have a relationship with God? Probably not. Probably not. I don't see it like that. Ah uh, well, my my own experience is that. You know, is that as I've encountered many people who have this this kind of anger against God, um, and who uh, who see him. You know, he, he killed my mother. He killed my father. He took all these things away from me. You know, why should I love him? Today is a perfect example with the shootings. Yeah. And how could God let something like this happen? Right. Yeah. And, and how could there be such a God who would let something happen? Therefore, there has to be no God. Is so many people, you know, really natural conclude. disaster, really. like Hurricane Sandy or other things like the big tsunami. Like oh, yeah, thousands of millions, you know, thousands yeah. of people. Who told you that it's got to do that? But you know, but some people may get angry because they're like, well, How do I take my children? Yeah, and so, and so, um, when a person has that kind of anger against God what they need to do is realize that they have a false image of God. And, uh, and they also need to realize that they have to let God be God. And, not, and that God is not um, the one who I manipulate by my prayers. There's a story in Anthony Bloom, in Anthony Bloom's writings, 
um, when he was a kid. He was a, a real zealous, you know, young young guy, and um, <coughs> his and he and he never missed his prayer rule. Um, but when almost except except when he did, he would just beat himself up horribly, and. Um, so he went went to his, his spiritual father and said, "Oh, I missed my prayer rule again. It was horrible, you know. I'm, you know, the worst of all sins, and on and on and on." And so his spiritual father looked at him and said, "So, you think the ceiling is going to cave in on you if you miss your prayer rule? Unless you do all of those prayers and all of those canons and all of those akathists." And he said, "Yeah." <laughs> I do, <laughs> and so and so his spiritual father uh, said, "Well, I forbid you to pray." <laughs> uh, the, you can the only thing you can pray is, "Lord, have mercy on me for the sake of those who love me." You can say that five times before you go to bed, and that's it. <laughs> uh, that prayer had more effect on his life than all the rest of the prayers, you know, put together, you know, stood there mumbling, you know, just to, just to get through. Um, we need, so often our, our relationship with God is, is, uh, <coughs> to a, we relate to God as to a, as to a kind of a, a static image. was known as an idol, um, as an idol, um, and we either, and how often do we not expect God to work in our lives, or expect God to answer our prayers, or if we do and then we become bitterly disappointed, it's um, because we didn't do enough, and we don't take into account that maybe God just said no. But I think what's important is, that, is to remember that God is God, and we can't manipulate him, and sometimes he's going to say no. And uh, we can't get mad at him for saying no, because that's his prerogative. Um, you know, uh, do horrible disasters happen? Yep. Is it, is it God's will that evil things happen? No. But is it within his providence? Yes. And this is the one of the hardest things to understand. Um, <coughs> that everything happens within God's providence. Because it's 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 very important not to think that there is some kind of a um, you, you've got God and the devil battling one another as if there were two equal powers. No. Uh, in fact, according to the fathers, uh, while while you while I, of course we do, and they affirm that there are, are demons and the evil and Satan and the evil one. Evil itself has no existence. It's simply the negation of that which is good. And while and while the and. Uh, and so even the things that are that are horrible come from the providence of God are within God's providence and this is what we cannot understand why would God allow some crazy person to shoot up an elementary school why would God allow a tsunami <laughs> You don't ask why to God. Right, but a lot of people do. And um, if you... Right. Well, it's futile, actually. Um, but, 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 but the attitude that we have to take in this is a complete surrender to God's will. Absolute, complete surrender. And it's allowing God to be God and that we will strive to be obedient to him, whatever the cost. 
and whatever it is that he will we'll, that uh, we won't you know we won't get mad when uh, we don't get the job that we have been praying for and lighting candles for and you know and saying akathists and and things for um, we won't we won't abandon God if if something bad happens to us we we'll remain faithful whatever happens and it's that that total commitment to God that total commitment. Um, of abandonment to his will, self-abandonment to his will, which is, which is what helps us get a, um, to, to deal with whatever it is that, in life that comes. You know, there's still, there's still grief, there's still sadness, there's, you know, but, um, but whatever comes is somehow within God's will and we can use it as a, as a means of working out our salvation. Um, but when we uh, step back from it and say, no, God betrayed me and God did all of this and took all of these people and, it, and I can't deal with it, well, that's, uh, that's incredibly self-destructive. Yeah, my sister told me a story about a Protestant minister who, upon helping some people with the uh, Katrina disaster, looked out over the wreckage and he said, there is no God that's good that could allow this to happen. And at that point, he threw down his ministry and just walked away from it. And, you know, I think what uh, Father John was talking about was exactly that when you say, you know, yeah. you have, you know this is... This is a resentment I have of God that I have to get rid of. And uh, he just took the wrong path. Yep. Exactly. Because somehow dealing with, <clears throat> dealing with that and confronting that might have been his path to salvation. You know, we, so how often you know, we have this, you know, this image of God as Santa Claus. You know, and for a good boy, he'll, you know, we won't get coal in our stocking. You know, we'll get candy and we'll get what we want. And we try and manipulate God. And it's, of course, it's very childish. Very childish. We have to be like children, but we can't be childish. There's a big difference. Uh, there's a big difference. Um, because we have, we have to accept, we have to accept God regardless of what happens in His providence. Even in His providence for our own lives, much less, you know, some grand disaster or halfway across the world. Yes. Does it balance the image to think of Christ suffering for us? Mm -hmm. Because he was God, and he's not standing by. Mm -hmm. He's suffering with every suffering human being. Yeah. And he accepted God's providence for him, mm -hmm. <laughs> which meant to suffer and to die, and to, and, and to go to hell. Yeah. But we can't forget that Christ descended into Hades. Um, so. Uh, and so Jesus shows us he, he's an image for us of what that faithfulness is <coughs> even in the midst of feeling abandoned he wasn't abandoned he just felt that way kind of circumstances or events, you know, like shooting, like a way uh, that, you know, the lessons must be learned somehow, you know, and uh, 
should we take these events and try to figure out what is the lessons we have to learn? Yeah. We all, I think, I mean, the only way to explain something like that is that we live in a, in a horrifically broken world. And, and people do insane <coughs> and evil things because they're broken, just as we are, um, some more than others. And so uh, we can also look for, we can also look for deeper meanings in, in it. Um, but we don't we can't know what it, what it is in God's providence that why that happened but that it all comes from God's providence whether you know both the good and the evil well I have a lesson here from the Old Testament from uh, the wisdom of Sarat which I think mm -hmm equates everything that's been said here and it says the teachable person will receive precise and accurate knowledge from God how he will recognize God as created everything in exactness of order and the way to find harmony and peace in life is to find our place in his plan and order mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so there's a plan for everything yeah, there's a lot um, actually Sirach deals with precisely these same questions in, in other places too so does Job. Mm -hmm. Sister. You know, I think there can be a danger in trying to determine why this happened and what it means and how I am in it. I think, I believe that acceptance of God's will, going back to Job, I think is the, is the right way for me to understand these things that happen. The acceptance that he is God and I'm not, and there will be a time, and he has promised me this, when I will understand, but I don't have to understand right now. And if he presents something that has happened, and that screams at me with some lesson, then take that lesson, absolutely, mm -hmm. but don't try to say, why did this happen? I, I think there's a trap there. Yeah. So. Vladika, what about the role of free will? Mm -hmm. God has given us free will, mm -hmm. and He does not interfere with that free will. That's right. It brought about the fall, which is, which created the atmosphere of good versus evil. So I think we have to think about that. Will you comment about? Well, um, that tr truly free will, in the theological sense, means that we have the freedom to be obedient to God, and that's true freedom. Um, the uh, in our brokenness, in our fa in the fallen state, um, uh, we think that free will means that we have uh, we can choose to do anything we want. Um, of course, we don't necessarily recognize the the consequences of that, uh, either short term or long term, um, and so uh, and so we lose sight of of uh, that the true freedom is obedience to God, and instead think that true that true freedom is is getting to do whatever I want and choose and have infinite number of choices. Um, in the in the sense of uh, um, in the theological sense, uh, choice is uh, uh, there are no choices when it comes to when it comes to um, true freedom. Mm -hmm. so in the definition of the word heresy. Yeah. When we think about it, it's to choose anything other than what God has ordained for us. Yeah. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Excuse me, this is the first time I've been to one of your sessions, so I just want to ask a clarifying question. Sure. You said that all things happen with God's providence, meaning that he does not necessarily will things to happen, particularly bad things, but he allows them to happen. Right. Consistent with, he, he, he allows the exercise of 
human individual free will. Yes, exactly. But are you also implying, though, that God does have the power to intervene? That, I mean, that God actually does sometimes directly intervene in human affairs, what we would call a miracle? Sure. So he has that power, and sometimes he chooses to, and sometimes he... Sometimes he chooses to, and sometimes not. You know, when somebody is healed miraculously of cancer, or of, you know, some kind of fatal illness, or... Um, uh, they have the sense that, you know, they, there's a car hurtling towards them and they feel like they've been pushed out of the way by no human being. <laughs> um, God intervenes um, when he chooses. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think one of the temptations especially as Americans, is with our kind of Calvinized culture, is, um, is the idea that uh, you know, there's this whole plan. God has a plan for your life. And in a sense, God you know, certainly knows everything that you're going to do. He sees, he sees your, your life as a whole, from birth to death. Um, and everything in between, knowing knowing everything that you'll do and every decision that you'll make, and but that doesn't mean that uh, he's controlling that, or that it's foreordained. Um, you have absolute, you have you have complete freedom of will, um, and yet he he foreknows uh, <coughs> what you're going to choose. Um, so. But so to discern the will of God doesn't mean to figure out what God's plan is for your life. To do, to do, to try to discern the will of God means to um, uh, figure out what the next right thing is. Um, and uh, and act accordingly, rather than you know rather one of the one of the worst things I've seen is a kind of paralysis. Coming from people trying to figure out the will of God for their lives, you know, and they and they they can't, obviously, and um, and they're stuck. So. When you were talking about the tsunamis, and you were talking about the fact that there is craziness and evil that gets perpetrated, I was thinking, what about? not just personal will, but collective will in some respects, that we are crazy and evil toward some of the beauty that God gave us, mm -hmm. our universe, and that collectively, you know, we're afraid to speak, we don't act too much, we don't do this, we don't do that, we don't make the right choices. Uh, we try to get along sometimes and allow evil to occur. When does collective will act? When, in other words, is there such a thing as collective will for good or evil? Yeah, well, uh, um, well, certainly there is for good, and I think one of the one of the there's a contrast drawn by Saint Paul in particular, you know, because he talks about you have the mind of Christ, you know, and that that the the more fully we enter into this living experience of communion with God, the more thoroughly we're purified of our own selfishness, and um, uh, the more in tune we can be, and more in synergy we can be with, uh, with the will of God, and, um, uh, which is also his activity. Um, but uh, in a sense, there's an op there's an opposite of that, you know, that we can agree together for for evil, not, um, you know, usually for our own uh, individual gratification, you know, and so so that's political movements and things like that. Um, but uh, and so we have to be, I think, very cognizant of, uh, you know, what are our you know what? What are we doing, and how are we? How are we acting? Um, are we trying to discern um, 
whether an action is blessable, <laughs> whether it's whether it's in synergy with the will of God, or whether it's um, uh, just my own passions speaking. But what about collective will? Well, it's then. It, I mean, it's kind of a collective desire to gratify our passions by doing whatever. You know, certainly the persecution of of some particular group or another, um, uh, or the a designation of an enemy. I mean, that's. I was thinking the opposite. Mm -hmm. Can there be collective will for good? Well, yeah. I would think so. Do we have an so. obligation to even try and do that? I think we are when we come to liturgy together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, in that sense. Yeah. So. Hmm. It's not a question I've ever thought about before. Yeah, to elaborate on this, I think we are you now societies are brought up to pretty much venerate the will of the majority, mm -hmm. the democracy, and so on. Even those who come from Soviet Union, remember it was the, uh, the most democratic country. At least that, that, that's what we were told. Right? So, uh, and uh, in fact, if you read the good book, you will see that majority is usually wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, Leviticus says, I don't remember exactly where, it says, don't follow majority to evil. In English translations, I believe it's a little smoothed out, something like no follow a multitude. Or, uh, so, uh, I don't know if there isn't the collective will, or there isn't, but it can be just as, as evil as a, as a personal or, or as good as a personal maybe. Well, Jesus didn't like exactly this. come to set up a democracy. <laughs> well, there, is one, there was one freedom fighter in, in, in the Gospel, Barabbas. Uh -huh. You know, when uh, this kind of events happens, you know, I always think that, you know, it is another call for us to repent. Mm -hmm. It's just another call. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, uh, all things are connected. We just discussed today that uh, there is yeah. everything is connected in this world, you mm -hmm. know. And when something in me personally happens, it definitely affects this crazy person, you know, yeah. one way or the other somehow, because everything is connected. And when uh, in each of us is just a little bit, and one of them is just this last drop. So um, I think, you know, this probably is the only lesson that we can take out of this, right? Mm -hmm. Is it right? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um. Or um, what I took out of it is, and, and I've already expressed it, um, this is the opportunity to pray for the soul of that poor deranged boy. Yeah. And, and to have compassion ourselves on him and on all of the, the people involved. Yeah. But he's, you know, to not forget that he's also made in the image of Christ and he's still our brother and not vilify him, his action, yes, mm -hmm. but not him. Well, that vilification is precisely that kind of uh, objectification that I was talking about. Right. Right. Okay. One little boy came out of the school and said, uh, the teacher told us we had to run away from the animal, and it made me so sad to hear that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.